So um, just want to introduce myself. My name's Rob Galvin. I'm responsible for the developer community around the Row Mobile uh, product suite. Um, I have been with Motorola Solutions for about eight years now. I've been doing development for a number of years uh, on a variety of different things. I've started in database application development, moved into uh, shrink wrap software uh, development, uh, have done some, some web development as well. Uh, in about, about, probably about nine months ago, I took this position to uh, take on the developer community and support you guys, right? Um, and in, in that time, I've seen a, I have seen a lot of developers and customers that have been making the jump or trying to make a jump. So in this presentation, what I want to cover is kind of go through building an application uh, step by step. And as we're going through that, pointing out some of the things that I've seen uh, people like yourself may have fallen into uh, as far as you know traps and just getting up to speed with with Rose Studio and building the application. Um, this demonstration and code is also online, so if you can't keep up uh, and you want to you know do the code uh, after hours or another time, it's available and you can download it in this tutorial uh, as well. So just uh, kind of as a show of hands, how many web developers do we have in the room? Okay. All right, good. So, and how many are um, developing on a Mac? Okay. All right. So, uh, I'm sure if you've seen some of the documentation and, and webinars from from Rhodes, Row Mobile, everything was kind of Mac focused. I'm trying trying to make this presentation more towards the Windows developer um, and kind of go through the scenarios there. So, I have a couple slides to get to. I'm not going to kill you by PowerPoint. I'm actually going to go through Rose Studio and point things out. I may jump back into PowerPoint just because it may be a little bit easier to see on the slide instead of the code. Um, but really just kind of walking through the application um, and, and building an application. We're going to build a inventory management application. So this is for the person that's in the store going through and just taking inventory of items. So they're going to scan the inventory. It's going to show a picture of the inventory of the item and it's going to keep track of how many times that person has counted that item. Okay, so we're actually going to build this application from scratch. We'll walk through it. And then at the end, uh, I have a couple other slides to go through some of the uh, recommendations for debugging and logging, um, and also kind of talk through some, uh, some best practices and leave you with kind of like three, three uh, top tips or recommendations. All right, so uh, let's just talk about the application approaches really quick. Um, with the introduction of Row Mobile Suite, we're really giving the developers kind of the best of all worlds, right? You have a lot of choices for developing applications. The first kind of approach that we've seen is, is the basic, I have a web application, uh, and now I want to enable device capabilities. I think somebody over there in the last session had an example of that. And today, you know, we, we give you Row Elements version one, which you install on a device. Okay, you don't need to compile anything. You just basically need to point it to HTML code. Okay, and we provide you uh, HTML and JavaScript APIs to hook into device capabilities, as well as HTML5 features. The next kind of step up to that is what we call hybrid uh, web application. And Jeff Baremba is going to be doing a great demonstration later today and tomorrow um, on taking that HTML and packaging it up as a native application, right? Um, so yes, you will we'll need to compile this application in Rose Studio, but it's kind of like the baby step into the Rose Studio world. You don't have to go full bore and learn Ruby and et cetera. You just need to take your application and include it uh, in a Rose Studio project. And now you can customize the icon, you can change the splash screen, and really make it look like a true native application. I have an example on my ET1 that I'm going to show you guys later. Um, that we did, it's, it's very simple. So that, that's kind of the next step up. I'm not going to be talking about those two application approaches. I will be talking about the next two, which is a native, two variants of native, right? Um, and the reason I, I uh, have them down is two. I just want to uh, talk about the second one a bit, uh, this, this concept uh, called shared runtime. And I have a slide on this later on. This is a new um, um, option that we're giving you guys for um, scenarios where you need multiple applications on a device. And it allows you to really kind of deliver um, the application in the smallest form factor and really have the, a, a minimized footprint um, on the device. And in these scenarios, the native application approach, which we're going to walk through, 
Um, you now have the full HTML, JavaScript, and Ruby device APIs that, that we give you. Okay, so this is really the, the comprehensive uh, list. Okay, so Rose Studio, probably cover this really quick. This is an, an Eclipse-based um, IDE. It's a plugin. So if you already use Eclipse, show of hands, who's familiar with Eclipse? Okay, so pretty good, pretty good, uh, good amount. Um, it does require the native SDK installed in order to build the application. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, the nice thing about the Eclipse plugin is that it, it does include a simulator, a row simulator. And I'm going to use that in showing you how to develop an application because it has some really nice tools um, to help you build your application. So application behavior. So at the end of the day, this application will really look like a native application. It will smell like an, a native application. It will look like a native application. But what's really important is that it really is behaving like a web application. It's essentially a mini web server that's running on a device where your application, you, user interface, is HTML, JavaScript, uh, Ruby, that is being presented by our Motorola WebKit. And it is behaving like a web application. So this is really important. This is like one of the traps that I'll talk a little bit more about uh, in, in the later slides. But this is really important just to understand how it works because your interaction between the different layers of the application, uh, you'll need to be aware of how it's behaving. And it's, it's like a, a, uh, a web application. So your application is, sitting, uh, is, is being presented by our WebKit. And like I mentioned before, we expose some device APIs through HTML, JavaScript, and Ruby. And then on top of that, it's the Real Mobile platform which provides some services. So database services, synchronization services, uh, data encryption. And, and that's what's talking to the native layer, right? Um, you can see the little puzzle piece there. That really represents an extension model for you um, to expose to your application. So if we, have an, if we don't have an API that you need, and you need some native capabilities, you can still um, hook into this, this Roll Mobile application by, by writing an extension. Um, and we do have some tutorials on doing that and documentation online. I think somebody actually had this yesterday in the pre-conference session that we walked through. Um, so anyway. All right, so really quick, uh, one of the questions that came up quite a bit yesterday, and this is why I threw the slide in there, Maybe Mark covered this. I was out of the room. Did he cover this, this slide already? But anyway, let me really cover it really quick. Uh, a row elements application, when we build an application in Row Studio, and you'll see this, there's a checkbox that says now use row elements. Okay? So row elements is the comprehensive set of APIs and, and functionality that we had available in version one. And now we've integrated that with the Rhodes platform. So Rhodes is really kind of a subset of a row elements application. In fact, we actually uh, moved some enterprise features from Rhodes and now are available uh, just inside a row elements application. So it's, you just need to be aware of when we talk about row elements, it's the entire uh, set of, of, of things here that we provide, okay? All right, so let's jump out of PowerPoint and uh, we'll just start building an application. So I already have, I'm not going to go through the installation and setup of the development environment. I talk about that in a little while. So I'm not going to cover that. We're just going to start with building an application. And then I'll come back to some of the, the nuances that I have seen that developers has, has uh, experienced when they're setting up their development environment. So um, this is probably really hard to see from the back, isn't it? Yeah? OK. All right. Let's. Trudge, trudge along through. I have these in slides as well if, you, if we want to flip over to it. So we're simply, we already have a, a project generator, so uh, an application generator. And you're simply just going through this wizard that we have. And again, you'll, you'll notice that there are many other things here. And again, this is an Eclipse plugin, so Eclipse is used for other development platforms for those who are not familiar with it. Um, but you, you're going to want to pick Row Mobile, Row Mobile application. And this is going to essentially define a structure for your application. I'm going to walk through what that structure means and the different components of it so you understand what is going on here when you do this. You don't have to go this way. This is just an easy way for you to quickly get started with building an application. So I'm going to go ahead and we're going to, we're going to call this an application, uh, inventory management application. If I can spell it. 
And you'll notice, as I mentioned before, there's this checkbox called Use Row Elements. Okay, when you check that, that is going to signal to Row Studio that your application is a Row Elements application, as opposed to a Roads application. Okay, so um, that's going to set up the configuration and the build parameter so that all of the components that we need to support all of those capabilities that I showed before are going to be in there. So that's really important. All right, so we'll just click finish. All right, so it takes a, it takes a second or so to, um, and probably on a faster machine than mine, um, to actually generate the application. While it's doing that, I think I want to jump back to the slides because I think it's going to be, this part's going to be easier to see from the slides. Okay, and I'll show this to you so you know I'm not doing smoke and mirrors here, but when you set up, uh, when you create a new application, you can see there's a lot of things going on here that have been set up already for you. And I just kind of walk, want to walk through what are the different, um, different points to that. So the, the main area here is the application folder. This is where your, your core application code is going to, to go. And um, you'll, see, you'll see that there's a couple of different uh, files, okay? The ERB files are what's called embedded Ruby, and we call them views. This is your presentation layer for your application. And we'll, we'll, we'll look through that in a second. The RB file is your, is your Ruby controller. This is where, if you're thinking about like a .NET uh, you know, web application, almost like the code behind is in, right? So this is where your Ruby code would go to uh, provide methods and actually do operations. The application is, is kind of driven by this, this file called the layout.erb, and I'll show you that in a second. And it's, it's really just kind of the default layout. We set up the kind of the, the default HTML structure for the rest of the application. Um, there's some, some things where you can actually change the, the loading page and the, and the loading uh, bitmap that are shown, okay? Um, a public folder, which has the, the linked CSS and JavaScript files. By default, we're including jQuery, jQuery mobile. You'll see there, um, as well as the corresponding CSS. This is where you would put, you know, other JavaScript files. Uh, images as well are in there. And then really it's kind of like two, uh, two important files here. The, you'll, you'll hear a lot build.yaml or .yml. And this is build time configurations. This is probably the number one area where people make mistakes when they're setting up their development environment. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, the the row config.txt is runtime configuration. So this file is accessed from runtime. So things like logging, other parameters are in there. Um, so it's important that you really understand these two files, okay? All right, so let's look at the layout.erb for a second so you understand what's going on. For those of you familiar with HTML, looks, this looks very familiar, right? Uh, standard HTML tags. And then you'll see in here that we have things that are in, uh, you know, percent brackets. And this is the embedded Ruby syntax, right? So those of you familiar with .NET, the same thing with if you want to have embedded, you know, C Sharp or, or Visual Basic. Same exact thing. This is all, um, this is all Ruby code. And we're doing some pre um, conditional statements based on our experience with the different platforms. We may, to, may need to include a different CSS file. So this is just, again, this is just a, a default setup. If you wanted to come in here and now there's a, the new latest and greatest uh, JavaScript framework library, you know, you can basically wipe this whole thing out and start with the example uh, that they provide on, on their website. So this layout file uh, is really, you know, kind of controlling the, 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 the view and the look of the application. All right, so when you set up your application to run for the first time, uh, you want to set up a run configuration. And in Eclipse, you can basically set up, um, um, you know, a run configuration parameters for each application that you have so that um, you can control the different behaviors. Maybe you want an application to start off in, in, in Android, Windows Mobile, et cetera. Um, and the key here is that when you're setting it up, you have a choice of the platform that you want to run in. And then you, you can also pick the, um, the destination. So there's three choices on the destination. There's um, simulator, row simulator, and then the actual device, okay? So row simulator is something that I wanted to demonstrate, and hopefully we'll be able to get back to that. Um, 
the simulator for the platform is the, the platform simulator, right? So when you have Windows Mobile set up, you have the emulator for Windows Mobile, Android, et cetera. Um, and if you want to run in the platform simulator, um, there's a special thing you need to make sure that you're aware of when you set up that linkage in, in the build.yaml. Here's the project that's set up. Here's the folders that we just talked about in, in Slideware. Okay. And now what I was going to actually show you is, was running the application for the first time, just so you, so you can kind of see what's happening, right? I know this is very basic, and some of you have already done this. Probably like, all right, Rob, you know, let's go on. But for the rest of us, um, you know, just getting to this point, I want to make sure everybody understands uh, what they're doing. So here's where you're setting up your run configuration. You want to select for a mobile application. You want to choose new because you're setting up a new configuration. So we'll just call this IM for now. Android Row Simulator. We're going to work on Row Simulator. That to me seems to, to be the quickest way to develop and test your application just to make sure the views look right, the flow looks right, is to use Row Simulator. It loads much quicker than the Android Simulator, much quicker than the Windows Mobile Simulator. I would try to use Rose Simulator as much as you can. Obviously, you can test some of the device capabilities like scanning or image capture, but you can definitely use it to, um, to you know, basically just test the, the main application. All right, so let's just run this guy. Okay, so you can see that really nothing much is going on here, but an application did load a uh, sample page, and I'll show you uh, where this is in the, in the code. And you have this, uh, this web inspect. There's some tools over here, which I'm going to get back to, which is a really great, great tool uh, for you to use to help you know, troubleshoot and debug your, your application. Um, but anyway, let's, take, let's just take a look at the code and kind of see what's going on here. So I'm going to load the the layout um, the layout.erb. I had that in slide where you can kind of see it here, um, and that text is really small. So we're we're just going to I meant to do this before. Let's just increase that text appearance. Uh, where is it? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm looking at it sideways. Okay, and then we just have uh, basic, right? Sorry, let's just make it that big. Okay, is that better? Get rid of this. Okay. So here's that code that we were just talking about in Slideware. We'll skip through all this. This is all conditional statements that, like I said, are loading different style sheets. Doing some jQuery stuff here. A lot of things going on here and just kind of setting up the, the default application. And as we get to the, the main body of the, uh, of the web page, you can see that this placeholder for content. So this is a configuration parameter that actually says where to get this default start page from. It defaults to your application uh, index.erb. So if we look at the app.index, again, it looks like a standard HTML page. We have some um, standard div tags. You can see, for those of you familiar with jQuery, you know, standard kind of jQuery syntax to delineate how the application looks. Some more conditional Ruby here, uh, just to kind of explain what's going on there. So you understand if the person is logged in, we change the button for the synchronization engine. So just some simple uh, conditional statements happening there. And then this is what we're seeing on the screen, right? Add link here. That's all that's happening right now, OK? So not very interesting. Now let's make it a little more interesting. Let's just close the. Uh, the simulator for a second. And now um, we're going to actually add our first um, data model. And 
And before I do that, let me just jump to the slides just to make sure we're okay. Okay. Before I add the data model, I just want to talk about the, the database for a second. Uh, some questions came up yesterday about what we, what we provide in our database uh, services. So um, we call our database ROM. It's a mini uh, database object mapper for row. And under the covers, the database is SQLite, except for BlackBerry. Um, but on all the other platforms, it's SQLite. And there's really two choices you have when setting up the, the data models. Um, there's property bag and fixed schema, OK? Property bag is what we default to. This is very good for um, when, there, when the data schema is uh, possibly changing. And you need to easily, you can easily add new attributes. So if you have a new field, you don't need to go in and create uh, modify table structures and, and set properties. You basically just start using that, that new property for, for the object. Very easy, very fast. Everything is indexed. It's on a single, single table. Okay, um, So uh, super quick, uh, lightning quick, and it's, it's great for adapting for, uh, for data migrations. On the other hand, we also offer a, a fixed schema method. And this is for you know, traditional uh, you know, relational database uh, type of structure. We're actually defining tables um, and properties for each data model. Okay. Um, so in this case, um, you know, indexes may need to be set up manually, so it may be you know somewhat slower um, in that regards. But you have both both opportunities for different types of, of data models here. And what I'm going to show you uh, now is is the property bag. Um, model. Okay. So we're going to go in here and we're going to actually create this model. I'm going to right click on the app folder because this is where all our application code is going to go. And I'm going to say new row mobile model. Okay. And now we're coming in here and um, we're defining a product catalog. We're going to have, oops, we're going to have, and by the way, it is case sensitive, so just, uh, just be careful of that. We're going to have two, uh, two data models. It's really hard to type when you're not looking at the screen. Um, we're going to have two data models. One is going to be the product catalog. This is the, you know, typically this, you know, this might come from a web service or even using Row Connect synchronization services for loading your product catalog. In our case, we're really just going to store um, three fields. We're going to you know, uh, store the name of the product, we're going to store the SKU, which is the barcode, and we're going to store a, a base64 representation of an image. So we don't have to transfer files for images, we just basically use a string. Okay? And it's really easy, that's how you define your model. You just come in here, define the name of the model, and again, it's case sensitive, so be careful of that. Um, and then you just define the attributes. Okay? So if I click Finish, it's going to go in, and let's take a look and see what it, what it actually did. So you notice that um, it created a new product catalog folder under the application folder. And it basically set up the main operations for that product model. Default views, remember ERB is a view. So we have an edit view, we have an index view, we have a new view. We have a show view, which is just to show the, the product catalog item. And then we actually have a product controller um, file that handles all of the operations for the data model. Okay, so if we just take a look at the new one, you can see that um, it's basically a form that has the fields that we define. So you see product catalog name, product catalog SKU. And like I mentioned before, with the property bag model, if we wanted to add a new field to the product catalog, maybe category, we would just essentially just copy and paste this section of the div tag and now add product catalog category. And now you instantly have a new referenceable uh, field for your data model. Okay? And if we take a look at the controller, you can see by default, we actually create um, all the CRUD operations for the data model. Okay, and we'll, we'll walk through this in a second so you can kind of see what's going on. Okay. 
So now, uh, in order to access that, let's go back to our index page. And let me just jump back to slides, just to make sure I didn't forget anything. So here we have the default CRUD operations for the views, the controller, which we'll explore a little bit more in a second. And now um, I want to pull up the, these default views. I want to show this new product model and use it. Okay? And the way to reference um, views and actually anything inside of, of Remobile is um, to basically use the controller name or the class. And then in this case, I'm calling a view. So it's going to be controller slash view. So I'm going to add to the index.erb product catalog, which by default will load the index. So whenever there's uh, not a view referenced, it'll always default to loading index.erb. Okay? Um, but I'm also just going to show you how you can reference directly to a specific page, right? Which is going to be important for our, applic our application. So let me go ahead and, and do that. Oops, didn't want to jump ahead there. All right. All right, so we're going to add, uh, and just so you don't have to see me typing, because it's getting kind of monotonous here, I'm just going to copy and paste it so I don't mess up. All right, so back over here. All right, so basically what I just did was added those lines of text that I showed you in slides. Okay. All right, so now let's get back and do the run. I'm going to run it again. How come I keep losing my mouse? Is there like a it's a dual display? All right. So run, run configurations. It's telling me that something's changed. Yes. Okay. See how fast it, it comes up. It does actually uh, come up pretty quick when you're using Row Simulator. So now we have two two new items on our index page. And this should go to the, this loads the index page for the new model that we created. And just by default, you can, you know, easily see that we have, here's the new page, right? And you can basically go in there and exercise and actually see all of the default CRUD operations that have been set up for you just with doing that new data model wizard, okay? And here's the, the other one that we just referenced right to the new screen. So this will jump right to the new page, OK? So still not no, super, super interesting, but this is a really quick way for you just to generate an application, generate a data model, and start playing around with it and understanding what's going on. So it's very good for, for learning, OK? All right, let me just jump back to the slides, OK? So now let's, we did, we actually did a, um, a new record. Okay, so let's just take a look at that for a second. Um, this code right here is in the, the new um, dot .erb view, okay? And what it's doing is it's doing a post, and it's, it's saying, you know, post to the URL effectively product catalog slash create. So it's, it's posting this form to product catalog slash create, which in turn, calls this method inside of the, the Ruby controller first, okay? So the way that uh, the URL is referenced is actually comes to the controller first, and if there's a matching uh, name associated with that uh, URL, it'll execute the code inside of Ruby, okay? And then it'll, re it'll either redirect or, or, or go to that page if there was a create.erb. So on the new page, we're actually doing a create, and it... Um, effectively calls this ROM API. So for every data model, you'll notice that I'm using the data model name here, product catalog. And for each data model that you create, you'll have a set of ROM APIs that you can execute. In this case, we're executing the create API and passing it this, this full object. Okay, and that's actually creating um, the new record. And then we're returning back to the, to the index page. Okay. There's a URL here. It's on the docs website. If you go to the ROM API section, 
you'll see a full, full list of APIs. All right, so let's just do some preloading of data um, and make this a little bit more interesting because I know it's probably pretty boring right now. Um, so in this case, I'm just going to load the data from a JSON file. Now, like I said before, typically um, what you would probably do is you would either set this up so it comes from web services or maybe you do want to preload it. And we actually do have a better way of seeding um, the database. Um, but the, way, the reason why I'm showing this to you is I just want to show you, you know, how to actually interface with JSON and then also just to, to possibly preload some, some data this way. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm, um, I'm going to create this file inside of Rose Studio. And I'm going to create a file in the public folder. And I'm just going to call it um, products.txt. Oops. Did a new project. Sorry. All right. New file. All right. Products.txt. Okay. And I'm just going to paste this this JSON um, file really quick. There's three fields. It's um, the SKU, which is the barcode, the name, which is the name of the product, and then just I have a base64. Um, data URI representation of the image. So I don't have to send any files. I can just include a string of um, uh, data URIs as my images. Okay? So that's just creating the file. Now I want to actually come in here to the application um, initialization page and go back to app. And if I go into the app um, application.rb, this is where the product, um, not the product, the, um, <clears throat> the application starts. So it initializes. We'll do some things in here a little bit later. And I'll probably run out of time with this. But essentially what we're going to do is now we're going to uh, load the database, load the product catalog table from this JSON file. So let me just go back to my handy dandy copy and paste cheat sheet here, and then I'll explain what, what's going on. And like I said, there, there's, there's better ways of doing this, but I'm doing it on purpose so I can show you guys some things here. All right, so let's just kind of walk through this really quick and let you know what I did. So I'm checking to see when the application launches to see if the product catalog has been created. And I'm using this ROM API again. This time, instead of create, I'm using find. And we're just seeing if they're, you know, find all. And we're seeing if, it, if it's empty. If it's empty, I'm using another API that we provide you to access uh, files and getting the, the JSON file and just, you know, iterating through the JSON file and we also provide this nice uh, JSON uh, library as well for you to parse the, the lines. So eff effectively, it's reading each line, it's parsing them from JSON, and for each object, each JSON object that it iterates through, it again is using this ROM API to, cr um, to create a record. Now, instead of uh, passing in an object like we did before, I'm doing it this way to show you that you can actually pass in this hashtag. And for those of you who don't know, hashtag is attend the Ruby 101 session that we have uh, tomorrow. But effectively, it's, 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 it's passing in this object this way and creating, um, you know, creating the records that way. Okay, so it's going to do that on first run. And that's effectively it. I have some comments in there. So now let's, uh, let's save this. And just by habit, I, I always forget to close the simulator, but I always like to just uh, close it and restart it. In some cases, you don't have to when you're just changing views and, and things. Let's do another run, run configurations. So now I'm going to look at the product catalog. And because it wasn't empty, 
Remember I created that record before, the code actually didn't run, so I forgot to do something in my step. So what I'm gonna do here is um, we have a nice way of, of resetting the database. So this is kind of pre-built in here, just as a quick, quick way for you to reset the database. And then um, I'm just gonna launch it again. Okay, so now you can see that the records that we had in our JSON file actually got created. So this went one by one and created a new object. We can jump into the show page and actually see the data that came in here. Um, so that's uh, preloading it. We wanna, obviously we don't wanna show the image like that. We wanna make this list uh, look a little different. So we're gonna do some quick, uh, quick changes to, the, to that page uh, to show you how to make it look a little bit more interesting. And that's not page I wanted. Okay, so um, let's go back to that list page. Now remember, we were showing product catalog and the default list is index. So I wanna go into index.erb. You'll see that there's a .bb, .erb, that's for Blackberry, so we're not doing that right now. So I'm just gonna go into index and you can see that um, that's not the one I want. I went into the wrong one, so I'm in product catalog. Uh, it is the right one, I'm sorry. Uh, product catalog, and it's going through each uh, product catalog item, and it's, it's just showing the name right now. So again, embedded Ruby, and it's showing product catalog, which is the name of the, the variable here. Notice the case is different, right? Um, dot name. Okay, so it's just showing that now. We don't want to show the name. We actually want to show something a little more interesting. So I'm just going to post, uh, copy and paste some jQuery, uh, simple, really simple jQuery code here. Uh, I didn't follow my slides. Sorry, guys. I actually wanted to do one other thing first. Okay, so before I do that, let me just jump back to here, okay. Instead of the list, I actually wanted to just show you how to modify the, uh, the image. Just for the sake of time, we'll kind of we'll skip this step because we're gonna do it anyway inside of the, uh, the next step here. Um, <clears throat> actually, let me just do that really quick. It should only take a second. All right, so I wanted to show you I was jumping ahead of myself, the product show page, and actually changing the image. Um, instead of you know, the actual image, we just want to add um, an image tag here to show you that it's displaying the image. I'm going to save that. And here's where the, where the case is where you can probably just come in here and refresh the page. I don't have to re reload it. It was just a change to the view. So in those cases, you can pretty much just, you know, uh, have the simulator still running without having to, to, to stop it and launch it again. Okay. All right, so let's j just jump back to the slides for a second. And I see I'm gonna quickly run out of time. Um, but let's see if we can buzz saw through here really quick. 245, all right, so definitely gonna run out of time. All right, so we wanted to add a second data model in this case, and this is the inventory, um, inventory catalog, which is where we're actually doing the scanning. So we're gonna add, a, add another data model We're gonna call this inventory. And then we're gonna we're gonna create new two new um, two new properties. 
Q in quantity. Okay. All right. Um, all right, so we are definitely going to run out of time, guys. I'm sorry about this. So I think I'm going to kind of cut to the chase here because there are some important slides I want to get to um, as far as debugging and things like that. I think you guys kind of get the idea uh, of the application. Again, this tutorial is online. And I apologize. I did, I did test this out, and it was a lot quicker last time I did it. So um, what I want to do is actually uh, get out of here and just kind of show you the application working. OK, so we're going to flip over to the ET1, which I have on here. So it's getting cut off because of the DBI signal. But you can, you can see here that this is the page that we were going to create, which is very simple and shouldn't take an hour, but it is, unfortunately. Um, so we basically set up our, our default pages, and we created this new page without touching any of the kind of default pages that were set up, OK? And on this page, what we're doing is, when the page loads, we're actually enabling the scanner using one of our mobile APIs that we have available. So the scanner's on in this page. And when it, uh, when it scans for the barcode, if I can point over an image, there we go. OK, the volume is off. Um, Okay, let's keep it that way. <laughs> it actually put, retrieves the, the image from the original product catalog page, displays it on this page, and just keeps a count. And it keeps a running count. And the button on the top here actually goes through and pulls up that same index, right? So I went through the wizards just to kind of create the pages. And I'm recommending this as an approach for those of you who are new to go through those wizards, keep all of that stuff intact. And then when you're actually developing your, your code, build new pages and reference those objects inside of those controllers. And that's kind of what I did here. You'll see it <coughs> online through the tutorial if you follow through it. And you'll see it in the source code. Okay? And that's essentially what this application does. Very simple. Could probably be jazzed up quite a bit more. But that's essentially it. So in this, in this case, I wanted to show you creating the data models, creating some new pages, and then hooking into the device um, APIs. All right. So we'll just we'll kind of buzz saw through the slides just because we're running out of time, and, and kind of talk through what I just showed you. So here's the code where we actually went through on our uh, inventory index page, and we're looking up the product by we're doing a, another ROM API for finding the first um, the first record that has conditions now. So here's where we're actually adding some conditional statements to our ROM APIs, and I'm saying all right where the SKU is equal to um, the SKU that we're trying to show in the list page. And if it's found, I'm retrieving the image and then effectively just um, you know, setting a variable. Okay? Um, and in this, in this case, we're just, we just changed the way that list is being shown. This is jQuery syntax. This span class, uh, blah, 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 is a nice way to show a thumbnail on the left and a badge count on the right-hand side. And that's what the page does. So this is, list, this is the list page for the actual inventory, OK? Very simple. There's really no magic going on here. It's this page right here, OK? Then this is where we actually created that scan page, right, that, that we just showed. Um, very simple div tags, some placeholders for, um, you know, for the different pieces of the, of the page, of the image. Um, you know, the barcode, the product name, et cetera. What's interesting on this page is how we're referencing the index list. Remember when we clicked the button, we actually went to the list of, um, you know, inventory that we scanned in. And it's referenced, again, by app slash inventory. So this is all, you know, you need to make sure you're matching the names, right? Inventory slash index. So it's loading inventory and then the actual index. Remember, as I said in the beginning, this is a mini web server application. This is why it's important for you to think about that, because that's how you're referencing the different pieces of the code. OK, and that's what's happening here. We're doing inventory slash scan page, and that brings you down to, to that page. So that's how it's referenced, just through, just through typical URL references. Um, 
on this. So when this, like I said before, when this page loads, when we reference inventory slash scan page, we're actually, it's checking the controller file first to see if it has a matching method for scan page. So we added this to the code, or we were going to add this until we ran out of time. We added this scan page, which matches the URL reference, and this is where we're actually um, enabling the scanner. So two lines of code here. I just enabled what happens when uh, the decode event happens, and we're going to call this decode event callback method, which we would create, and then scanner.enable, and that enables the scanner. So before that page is loaded, this, this code here executes. And then we created this decode event callback, and effectively on this event, based off of the API that we used, um, this scanner API returns a params array, and one of the fields in the params array is data, which is the barcode. So we set that to a variable, and again, we're using the ROM APIs to find the product that matches that barcode, and the reason that we're doing that is if we accidentally scan something that's not in the product catalog, we don't want to miss it. We'll just create a new record and just say unknown product, so the user could update it. Um, but more importantly, what we're doing here is we're actually um, looking up, uh, if it has an image, um, we're doing this function here called webview.execute.js. And this is really important because this is how you communicate back to the view, right? So remember, we're in Ruby, we're in the code behind. Now we want to tell the page to do something. We want to tell the page to load that image. So we provide this web view. Remember, it's a mini web server application. Everything's displayed through the web view. So that's how we communicate from the code behind to the front end, if you will. And we're saying execute JavaScript, this JavaScript function that we create that essentially just changes the image source. It's not really anything spectacular here, but just wanted to show you that that's the big communication link there between the kind of code behind and the front end. Okay. So more stuff that we're doing on the decode uh, callback is, you know, we're, we're, we're finding to see if we scan that inventory already. If we did, uh, if we didn't, then we're going to create, again, like we, just like we preloaded the product catalog, we're using the ROM API here to create a new inventory item record, SKU and quantity, setting it to one. Otherwise, if we didn't find one, we're actually, I mean, if we did find one, we're getting the current count, converting the value to an integer, and updating it. Now, again, this is a ROM API to update attributes. This is how you would update a record. So in this case, the inventory item is the item that we found. So we already have an object, and now we're just calling update attributes to update the, the, um, the quantity property for that object. Okay. And then again, at the bottom, we're calling this web view execute JS. So this way we display the product name, the, uh, I'm sorry, the barcode, and also the current count. Okay. Let's skip this one. Okay, now, um, going the other way, let's say you, what we didn't show in the, uh, what I didn't show in the demo was when the application first loads, it checks the current count. So, um, what I'm doing here is I'm hooking into the, the page live event. Again, this is jQuery syntax for understanding that the page is fully loaded and that we want to do something. And in this case, um, I'm calling my Ruby method that I created before, which I breezed through. This get inventory count is something that I created in the controller file. So now it's the other way. I want to communicate from the, from the view, from the web page, and call uh, the Ruby method in the back end. And remember, this is a mini web server, mini web application. Um, how do you do that? It's through Ajax, right? So dollar sign get is just a jQuery syntax for Ajax. And then what's important here is the path. So I'm referencing the path here to get to the method, right? So it's, you know, where is that method? It's in the controller. It's in the inventory controller under the application. And that is uh, executing that, that code when the page loads. And then in return, you know, that page is, is displaying, changing the display on the button. All right, well, uh, running out of time, I'm going to skip this. Running on a device. Okay, 
Here's some really important things to, to note. The big problems that we had yesterday for people setting up, not big problems, but things that tip, people typically run into is when they create a project, remember, this, this relies on the underlying SDK, for, uh, yeah, thank you, in order for it to execute. So um, it needs to be linked properly, right? And the way that we do that is we actually provide in the build.yaml. Remember I said that the build.yaml is very important. <coughs> Um, there's two things you need to make sure that you have set up properly. The first is in Rose Studio Preferences that you actually have links to the particular um, SDKs there and proper, right? So in Windows Mobile, I'm linking to the Cab Wizard, and I'm also linking to the Visual Studio Build Tool. If you don't have these set properly, it's not going to build the application. It calls out to the native SDK, and it's all through command line, basically and it compiles the application. So it's important that you have that set up properly. Um, the other thing that's important is, like on my machine, I don't have Windows Mobile Professional SDK installed. I have Professional 653 DDK, blah, 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 blah. This name needs to match what you have in your uh, SDK uh, installed, right? Uh, same thing for Android. I don't have Android version 2.1, but that's what we default to. Um, so I have 2.3.3 or whatever it is. If this SDK doesn't exist in your Android SDK setup, it will fail to build, right? So this is probably like 80% of the problems that I've seen recently on people saying, hey, it doesn't build, right? And because things are command line, you may not really notice that in, in the build log as you're looking at it. Okay, and there is a build log that, ha that is you know, displayed as you're, as you're compiling. You'll see, you know, see things happen. Look at this log file. It may not be that last error that you see, as you guys are familiar with log files. Look up above, obviously, and there's probably some clues um, up above. And this is what I was talking about before. Um, you need to make sure that the names are matching. So this is Visual Studio. Here's Android. And if I didn't have this installed, then this 2.1 is not going to work, right? So it's very important to make sure that's set up properly. Um, in the sequence of events, think about the, the way that it works is it compiles uh, row mobile components, then it reaches out to the native SDK and tells that to compile the final product. And then it creates this APK in the case of Android or CAB in the case of Windows Mobile under your project folder, okay, inventory management, bin, target, this is where that file is going to end up, and then it tries to push it to the device. So in some cases I've seen people say that it failed to build, it didn't get on the device. Well, this, I would check here just to make sure that it actually got to that step. Maybe it's an issue of Active Sync or the way you have uh, Android set up for development and that it's not communicating properly. So this way you can kind of narrow down where the problems are. And then, you know, this may sound stupid, but I know we're out of time, Adam. But try Hello World application on the native, uh, the native SDK just to make sure that in build environment is set up properly. Okay, I'm going to blow through some of this. Um, okay, I will, I will spend a minute on this, and I know we're going over. Row Simulator is definitely a, a, a great tool to get familiar with. Um, it has a fantastic resources there for checking um, you know, the, the contents of the page, page load time, where is it loading, is it taking time in, um, in scripting, is it taking time in rendering. This is definitely a tool, if you're not familiar with this, you should definitely get familiar with it. Uh, it's also available on other web browsers as well, similar tools. So definitely, um, you know, get familiar with this. It has several uh, different different tools for you to debug your application. Some logging, shared runtime we talked about. I'm just gonna three final thoughts and then we'll stop. So one thing I just wanted to mention, like I said before, the application is a web application, a mobile web application. So think like a mobile web developer, right? Get familiar with the tools, even tools that are outside of Rose Studio that could help you in your application development. Right? Whether it's page construction, use of JavaScript, you know, what have you. Think, you know, you, although the application is a native application, think about it in terms of a web application. Um, 
Definitely want to avoid, you know, a bloated page. Again, web application men mentality. Uh, we've seen some, some customers and, and partners that have tried to load everything on the page. Keep it simple. You don't really need, you know, 100 million sub div tags that you're not even displaying half of them, right? So be aware of that. Use Ajax to only load, you know, what you're actually showing on the page and not try to put everything in this one, one massive, um, you know, DOM structure. And then lastly, you know, watch out for overkill. I've seen some applications where they had 50 JavaScript libraries and do you really need to do all that? Think about it 100 times before you actually, um, actually use it. You know, if you're just using jQuery just for the dollar sign, there may be other ways to do it. So just be aware of what you're using and, and why you need it. You may not actually need, you may not need all of that. So thank you again. Apologize for running over. And sorry we couldn't get to everything. <laughs>